Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the Hudson Valley Squares. We're back. Did you miss us? I missed us. I, I you know, I, I look forward to seeing all these faces every other week, used to be every week. And when you miss a week in between, you know, for a holiday or something, I miss my Hudson Valley Square family. Aww. So I'm glad we're all here together with all of you watching tonight. Chris Allo will be joining us momentarily. He's uh, running a little late, but let me introduce who is here tonight. Brian Scow's here. What up? Ice is here for Bryce Talks Metal. Uh, Count Ralph is, Ralph Tambor is in the house. Right on. Rob Lasante, Mr. Darth Metal himself is our center square tonight. Craig Kaminsky is here as well. Nick Franco's with us tonight. What's up, everybody? And last but certainly not least, my partner in fuzz, Miss Karen La Preziosa. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Howdy, everybody. So, Howdy. By request from Miss Karen, uh, she would wanted us to do a pick our favorite out al favorite albums from a year in the '90s. So we figured we'd start a little bit early in the '90s because we haven't done this particular year yet. So we're going 1991, kind of a transition year, right? For a lot of styles of music. You know, metal is kind of on the outs with the masses. Grunge and alternative is kind of coming in, but there's emergences of other things that are coming out. Prog is coming back. You got kind of all different kinds of punk is coming in. You got the extreme metal underground is gaining lots of momentum. So there's all sorts of things happening in the 90s. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what everybody's picked. I also have Butch, Butch couldn't make it tonight. I have his pick, so I'll do them during mine. So we'll go, we'll go each turn around. Everybody will give two. So we'll go two, two, and then our number one. Then we'll do some honorable mentions at the end. So uh, ladies first, as always. So Karen, what are your first two picks of the uh, the day? Not my top two. Uh, you're number five and four, I guess. Oof. Oof. Five and four. Okay. Um, this is a, a pivotal year for me in music. Uh you mentioned that um Prague was making a comeback, but for me it's the it's the opposite. I was getting more and more primitive, more and more basic, and I really I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> um I'm gonna go with my number three, or excuse me, my four and five. I'm going to say Jeff Dahl, Ultra Under, his album, Ultra Under. He sounds a lot like the Stooges. He's very, very rock and roll. Um, it's his second record. It was on Triple X Records. It was, um, he rec wrote, recorded, he played everything on there. He did a great cover of uh, Cherry Bomb from the Runaways. And he even has like a little piano bell in there called Just Amazing. But he sings like Iggy, very flat, and it's it's kind of funny. Whoa. <laughs> and, Chris Allen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Better late than ever. So, sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Okay. So, yeah, Jeff Dahl, uh, Ultra Under, is my four. Uh, five, I'm, this is a tie, really, a Spaceman 3. Um, this is their last record. It's their fourth and last record called Recurring. Uh, it's really two different records. Um, they broke up right after this album, actually, uh, before it was even released. So the A side is uh, Peter Kemper. He wrote everything. And the B side is Jason Pierce. The B side is more, uh, the songs have more structure. Uh, they have more of a flow to them. It's still very psychedelic and very spacey. Um, but I kind of like the A side better. It's more primitive. It's more electronic and it's weird <laughs> so those are my two uh jeff doll and spaceman three and they're so 1991 absolutely <laughs> all, right. all right iced earth man nick franco's in the house what do you got for your first two picks nick? all right what's up so um for my number five i'm going with uh one of my favorites i discovered in uh the early years of high school and that would be bolt thrower from england Yes. <laughs> yeah, and their album War Master. Um, this is just a, you know, they they emerged from a world that was like death metal and punk slammed together with uh, just a real awesome bass tone and and just like deep guttural vocals. And everything about War and obviously the uh, at this time the more fantastical nature of War and War Master just to me was just an absolute 
blast the face that to this day um sounds just as good as it did back then and i have to give it some love um there's a lot of great uh, it was like one of the basically i'd say to me death metal was speaking around this time or you know in those those couple years and and to me both for was uh right there at the top of the heap and then um number four for me is um dismember like an ever-flowing stream the first dismember album uh 1991 again just an unbelievable year um nobody mixed uh melody and and yeah there you go right um, right so good look at you <laughs> yeah, that of sweden one of the um the swedish death uh forefathers there um i once said it was like being um having your face smashed repeatedly with a velvet glove um because as just mean as the as the music sounded the the bass and the guitar and that the vocals uh it was as melodic as you could imagine these guys were all all grew up loving iron maiden in fact the um i once had a discussion with the with uh david blomquist the guitar player from this member about iron maiden and how much he loves them um so to me the mixture of death metal and melodic metal that i had grown up with was was amazing so those two death metal uh gems are my my five and four Ooh. Craig what's going on uh, thanks thanks uh, again great to see everybody I've been on a withdrawal myself on these last few Mondays so uh, it's, it's good to see everyone but uh, my number five I'm starting uh, if you ever thought it's like what would uh, what would the singer of Deep Purple sound like fronting a hair metal band sort of and that's uh, my number five pick which is Ian Gillen's toolbox uh, yeah. pretty, pretty much one of his last albums where he's really screaming up a storm uh on on this doesn't sound like deep purple there's no organ or anything like that and it just guitar bass drums pretty heavy and the drums are courtesy of leonard hayes from y and t uh leslie west from uh, the Great Mountain, uh, plays lead guitar on opening track, Hang Me Out to Dry. But a good, fun rock and roll album from Ian Gillen. Uh, this was during his wilderness years while he was out of Deep Purple before he rejoined them a couple years later. My number four pick, I went with Prong's Prove You Wrong. Uh, really um. fun heavy album that, I, that I, I happen to like a lot. Good workout album as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Irrelevant Thoughts, Unconditional. The title track, Prove You Wrong, is is always a good one. If somebody thinks uh, you throw it back at somebody when they say you can't do something, I'm going to prove you, prove you wrong. Uh, get a grip on yourself. Another, another good uh, uh, track from this. Fun, heavy, and uh, just quality from the three guys in prong. So that's my number four pick. Nice. All right. Rob. Oh, that was quick. Uh, yeah, it's good to see everybody and be back on the channel. And, uh, and, you know, it was good seeing you guys at the Metal Church show, Pete and Chris. And actually, I saw Chris too. Chris Capri was there too. So we had a good time. Um, you know, this this was a hard year. When I started to do research on this year, I was like, wow, there was a lot of great albums. And I have, I have some honorable. So, but uh, these were my top five. My, my first one is Parallels from Fate's Warning. Uh, I really started getting into them around this time. Uh, I know I was a little late to the party with that too. Just like, you know, I was a little later with the Dream Theater, but this album is one of my favorite albums that they put out <clears throat> and, you know, features uh, Ray, uh, Ray and uh, and Jim and, uh, and Frank Oresti on guitar. And then you have James Labrie on the second track, Life in Stillwater. And he had just a joint dream theater so this is one of my favorite albums from fates of warning you know I, I love all their albums but this is particularly one of my favorite ones even though it's not all heavy you know what i mean but it, the music on it's great the writing is great so that's one of my favorites and then my number four we're going to get a little heavier with the new york boys and that's overkill horoscope okay so overkill for me i've been into overkill uh almost since when they came out, even though I wasn't really a thrash guy in the beginning, you know, I, I got thrash a little bit later, like in the late eighties, but overkill for some reason always was in my radar. And, uh, this was, uh, they had, I don't know the whole situation. Maybe Chris knows this about Bobby Gustafson leaving the band or he was fired, whatever it was. And, um, uh, this came out in September of 91 and 
the songs on here are just, I mean, it's one of the best albums. Coma, Infectious, Thanks for Nothing, which they do a lot. Uh, <clears throat> Horoscope, Bare Bones, New Machine. Even They do a cover of Frankenstein, which is pretty good. Uh, for me, this is uh, one of their better albums, too, that I, that I really like and I listen to often. Uh, you know, uh, that's really it on those two for me. I mean, th th those two albums start my... Uh, the year for 1991 and like i said there's a lot of good albums that year but oh yeah you know. that was actually my first overkill album just how it worked out really i bought that one yeah just how it worked out because it, it got pretty i think it got a pretty big pop and it's a great album it's one of my favorites by them so yeah. to this day i look like i'm picking out an overkill album that's usually in the top two or three that i'll choose well, you mentioned Bobby Gustafson. i mean that there's still a lot of people out there who like refuse to listen to any overkill album since he left Really, he he was in violence for a minute recently. Yeah, that was a, that was the last thing he had going on. Hmm. Good player, but you know it's, they've done a lot of good albums without him. So yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, even even the, the new album is great. If you oh yeah, you haven't heard Scorched? Go get it. Yeah. All right, Ralph. All right, <laughs> like um, you were saying that like metal kind of was dying at that time, but like for me and my friends in the extreme underground, it was uh, one of the most unbelievable years. It was just nonstop new shit coming out. A lot of great debuts by bands that I still love today and still playing all the time. But I'm going to start off with the same. I'm going to follow Mr. Franco with Warmaster. I got this on vinyl, but I didn't want to pull all my vinyl out. It was so hot in this house today, so I stuck yeah. with all the CDs today. But uh, yeah, just like what Nick said about it, it I, uh, Realms of Chaos has always been my favorite, but this is right up there with it. Such a great album. Top two. My, my next one is going to be uh, Cannibal Corpse, Butchered at Birth. Another Chris Barnes classic from, you know, one of the, it really put him on the map. Everything was blowing up with death metal at the time. And uh, it was just uh, one of the best albums I thought of the year. And it's, it's I got a ton of honorable mentions, but I'll try to throw some of them up as people are saying them, so I don't have to show them again later. But <laughs> yeah, that's my cool, Bryce. Cool. So, uh, 1991, pretty interesting year. Uh, of course, a lot of the really extreme stuff coming out, but my beloved glam metal was starting to kind of go out of style. Unfortunately, we had the bullshit grunge coming along. Frick Nirvana, frick Pearl Jam. Okay, yeah. they suck. They're trash. Isn't that cute? <laughs> They're trash. But they how suck. Do you really feel? Hey, no, that's that's oh, trash. Wow, that. Okay, so a lot of the glam bands did start to sink <laughs> or swim, but one band that really thrived, you know, kept on swimming was Skid Row. They got heavier. They evolved with the time. So my uh, number five is Slave to the Grind. Great album. Great choice. I think it. I seen some people. Album. Yeah, it is a great it's album. Great album. It's Ooh. tough. I like the first one a little bit better, but. This one's still really good, great, heavy, consistent. Sebastian Bach is one of the best singers ever. He hits crazy high notes. Uh, Dave Sabo, Scotty Hill, really great guitar players. I actually saw them recently live a year or two ago with their new singer, and he's amazing. Um, they've still got the two classic guitar players and the original bassist, uh, Rachel Bolin. So, you know, they're still putting on a good show. They sound amazing live. A lot of people, unfortunately, kind of like the overkill situation, will just refuse to like acknowledge skid row at all because they don't have sebastian bach which i think is dumb they still sound awesome live so go see them if you get a chance but uh, that is my number five and my number four just for me pretty much the most consistent and best musicianship in a death metal band we got death with human just fantastic just an amazing run of albums death went on in the late 80s through the 90s just yeah chuck shoulder was a genius everything he put out was fantastic and this this uh, goes along with that, just flattening of emotion, suicide machines, uh, sh suicide machine, lack of comprehension, which had a music video. It's pretty cool. Just a fantastic album at number four for me. Nice. Yeah. Great album. Yep. Ryan. All right. Well, like some of you guys said, uh, there's a lot of a lot of the rock and stuff that year wasn't really in it. Back that the 90s wasn't really my thing. But when it comes to underground metal, uh, all bets were off. There was so much of it. That was good. So I'm going to start off in the Garden State, but I'm not going with Overkill. I'm mm -hmm. going with one of the best death metal bands from the Garden State. They only put out one album. Uh, they broke up. A bunch of these guys went on to do other things. Uh, and that band is Ripping Corpse, Dreaming with the Dead. Uh, the most, 
most notable guy to come out of the band was Eric Rutan, who started Hate Eternal, and he plays in Cannibal Corpse now. But to me, this first uh, Ripping Corpse album is the greatest thing they ever did. It's a little different vocally. Well, I want to say a little bit hardcore. And the guys, Scott Rude was the vocalist. It almost has like a little hardcore sound to it, but it's not hardcore at all. It's just straight up death metal. It's very tight. Uh, the drummer, Brandon Thomas, very underrated, should have been huge. He was in a couple other bands that were pretty good, but just, you know, always kind of underground stuff. But yeah, I think one of the best death metal albums ever, especially from New Jersey, because they didn't have like a giant reputation for death metal. But if you have, if you want good underground, kind of old school classic death metal with a lot of thrash riffs that you never heard in the Ripping Corpse album, uh, I don't know how hard it is to find out because it's just it was pretty obscure. But check this out. Awesome. Awesome album. I always loved it. And then we're going to go down to uh, one of my favorite countries for metal, uh, Australia. But in 91, there was not yet a lot of uh, a lot of the underground Australian bands I like weren't really kicking off yet. Uh, so there was one, though, one of the first ones. And this album, they actually recorded it. Uh, it's kind of mixed on when they recorded it, but alleged, the legends say 1988. So it's pretty extreme for 88, but it didn't come out to 91. So here it is. Uh, one of the craziest fucking bands on the planet. And that band is Sadistic Execution and their first album, The Magus. Uh, this is... Uh, this is a hard band to recommend because you listen to it, you're like, okay, enough of that. But this this first album, it, it's more like uh like possessed, like kind of classic 80s death metal. But for like 86 or 88, sorry, 88 when they recorded this, it's one of the craziest fucking things on the planet. So it comes out 91, still one of the craziest things ever. It's just absolute fucking uh, you know what? Just go on YouTube, give it a listen. Probably won't be probably won't be to your liking, but yeah, maybe it is. But yeah, awesome Australian band, one of the first bands to put Australia on the map. And then now there's a million great bands from down there. You know, great uh, great country for good underground metal. But yeah, these guys were one of the first and one of the craziest. So the first Sadistic Execution album, the Magus. I love that artwork, too. Uh, the uh, One of the guys in the band, Rock, R-O-K, did all their artwork throughout their career. And it reminded me a lot of uh, Away from Voivod. It's kind of got that same, like, post-apocalyptic kind of, a lot of spikes and that kind of yeah. shit. And uh yeah, this is one of his earlier artworks. So, love these guys. Cool, Mister Allo, how you doing? Okay, cool. Yeah, good, good, Pete. Thanks, thanks for having me. As far as late, uh, nineteen ninety one was a uh, was a good year uh, for metal for sure, and uh, nineteen ninety one was a good year for me personally because um, it's my second year of college, but my first year doing college radio, okay. and uh, I had a, a a show called The Heart Attack, H uh, A R D where I would play hard rock and, and metal uh, every Monday night from uh, nine to midnight, whatever the hell I wanted. And so it was really cool because for kids who only grew up with the internet, you know, I was able to listen to music without having to fucking buy it. Like, you know, it would, it would come in the mail and we got them early, the promos. And um, I definitely was able to hear a lot of cool shit and I could play whatever I wanted. Uh, so these first two uh, are ones that I played the hell of the hell out of um, on the station. Uh, number five, uh, Massacre from Beyond. Um, I was not a, uh, a huge death metal guy in 89, 90. It, oh, here we go. See, see Ralph, Ralph has it. Ralph, uh, it yeah. just, of it course just didn't, he does. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I got a couple copies on CD. I just, I was uh, too fucking lazy to look for it. I had friends show up and that's why I'm late. Anyway, uh, yeah, I was not a huge death metal guy uh, early on. Uh, I was not an early adapter, as the kids today like to say. And, uh, you know, I just, I always think that, you know, songs got to have hooks. And Massacre just did it for me. I was like, wow, these songs are great. You know, it's a bunch of ex guys from Death, uh, Dawn of Eternity, and, and Cryptic Realms. I used to play that on, on the, the station all the time. Uh, that's my number five. And my number four, uh, I was blown away in 1991 that there was actually a band like that was doing like Sabbath inspired doomy kind of metal. And that was a little band from Texas called Solitude Eternus. Mm -hmm. um, I played the hell out of their debut album Into the Depths of Sorrow. Uh, I used to play Opaque Divinity on the radio all the time. I became pen pals with Robert Lowe. I interviewed him for the station. 1991 was the first time I was actually able to interview bands. Um, and they, I thought they were a super cool band. I used to call into the um, there was a magazine, I don't even know if it's still around, called the College Music Journal. And if you had a yeah. show, is that still around, Karen? Uh, I know what you're talking about. They used to have a festival, music festival. Oh, uh, yeah. In, the, in, 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 the, in New York City, they, in uh, like the okay. fall, they used to do it. 
and they had a magazine that came out once a month and you would have to call in and report at the top 10 songs that you you were playing and i was part of the promotion team so i always said it was solitude eternus solitude eternus and robert lowe actually thanked me i'm in the thank you credits on the second record uh so i just always loved uh that band but yeah those are my two Chris, they uh solitude eternus reunited they're playing next year at uh, hell's heroes yes i heard so i i this year's hell's heroes was awesome and i'm really going to try and make it again because i'll definitely we'll be there so if you want to come coming with us I would, I would love to do it and i never saw them i um yeah they didn't they, really uh play too much up in this part of the states i don't uh, think oh, bryce is going to be there they right, played bryce. um new york probably City yeah in, in the 90s with paul like paul diano i think for the second record and i got drunk at a party and uh broke my kneecap so i couldn't go and i was really pissed off and i don't ever remember them playing up here again so well you see them in texas but you stayed yes. at a different hotel this time knock on <laughs> knock on wood yeah you guys are crazy i gotta stay with the old people <laughs> <laughs> not the party hotel yeah that yeah. chris <laughs> that's a great band though yeah for sure they, they, they have not released awesome. a bad album every album is really good yes. oh, those guys have a lot of stuff. Stuff. and then yeah. robert lowe front, fronted canada mass for yeah, so that's the reason why he got that gig he was yeah. a perfect choice for them mm. yeah, he was didn't last for I, that long but i think no. i seen them open up for merciful fader king diamond at one point in the 90s wow i'm pretty sure that's awesome possible that would be cool. All right. Uh, Butch's number five is the second album from Badlands, Voodoo Highway. Good pick. And his number four is uh, Tesla's Psychotic Supper. Another good one. So those are his four and five. And my number five is going to be Symbol of Salvation by Armored Saint. Love wow. this album. That's a great album. Yeah, oftentimes I call this my favorite Arm and Saint album because their first like, yeah. four are so good. Um, and just so many great songs on here. Rain of Fire is great. I love Dropping Like Flies. Last Train Home is a great kind of like ballad anthem and they always play it live. So many other goods. Another's Day is great. Title track is great. Really solid, solid record. In fact, Chris, didn't we see them play this whole album the last time, uh, like a couple of years ago? They toured and played this whole record. Yeah, wasn't that at the chance, right? Yeah, the last time yeah. they... Yep. The last time they came around was with Wasp, but the time before, before I think that. Yeah. we did the whole record at the chance. Whole record back start to finish. It was pretty, pretty intense. Really good. So that's my number five. My number four is also going to be Tesla's Psychotic Supper. Uh, love this band. Love their first couple of albums. I mean, Changing the Weather, Edison's Medicine, Don't De-Rock Me, Call It What You Want. One great song after another. I mean, it's got 13 tracks. Don't get tired of any song on here. Just good kick-ass, you know early 90s heavy rock i guess whatever you want to call them i never call them a hair metal band it kind of had this bluesy edge i always really like just good good solid heavy rock band so that's my four and five and uh, we'll go back to karen okay we're doing three two one or three two uh three two three two i don't know i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> number three yeah. uh the dwarves Thank heaven for little girls. <laughs> okay. This album, as I mentioned earlier, I'm getting more and more primitive and I'm getting more and more into punk at this point. And this is 17 minutes long, maybe 17 and change. I'm not, I I mean, I'm not one to listen to it. I never was. It just seemed like a waste of energy to put on something for 17 minutes. However, it was on all the time around my friends and everything. And it really made me want to see them live and once i started started to see the dwarves live i just got that i really wanted to see a garagey kind of punk and roll kind of like my i needed that energy and i was there for that and the dwarves uh really really helped me um get there uh for that record um i I don't even have a favorite track. I, I guess it's the first one, Satan. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, uh, it's, it's like I said, it's not a record that I would, I listen to, but I love it anyway. I have like a sentimental attachment for it. It's um, only 17 minutes. You just got to let the whole thing just play. Yeah. Well, it was on. And like, if, when we had the record store, it would be on in the record store. And then like, uh, you know, they were, I I lived in the at, in the West Coast at that time, so there you go, baby. They were they were around all the time, and I absolutely had so much fun every time I went to see the Dwarves. So, 
And the second number two is a seven inch. It's a split seven inch. And I know it's um, it's kind of cheating because it's not an album, but it was very um, influential it for me anyway. It's called uh, The Mummies versus the Wolfman. OK, and that was two songs by <laughs> the Mummy, two songs by the Wolfman. Um, the Wolfman is only one guy. OK. Uh, the Mummies was Land of a Thousand Dances from Wilson Pickett. They did such a great cover of that song. It's so good. And Victim of Circumstances, originally from uh, recorded in 1966 by Roy Jr. on Hickory Records. If you like garage music, if you like garage punk, you really need to get into the mummies if you if you if that's your thing i love it it's primitive it's lo-fi it's just guttural and just yeah i love it i love it i do so that record that split really was a a big thing for me and uh, the wolfman did um insane and insane world and i don't want no one but those are original tracks unlike the mummy songs were covers but uh yeah it's great yeah. That's it. My universal horror film ears perked up as soon as you said the title. Oh, like, he's in Wolfman. Yeah. So I just <laughs> I saw Frankenstein meets the Wolfman oh, like yeah. last week. There you but go. But the Wolfman <laughs> was only one man. Oh, it was one man in the movie too. Yeah. yeah. Lon Chaney Jr. But if you like garage, yeah. if you like garage music in general, sixties garage, then really check, search out that that single on YouTube. It's everywhere. It's really good. Cool. Nick. Awesome. Karen, you have some very interesting musical taste, I gotta say. Very always, yeah, very, very unpredictable. Like, cool. <laughs> Wait, Me, I'm very my number one is gonna freak you out. <laughs> I'm very predictable. Um, so for my number three, uh, little backstory on this one when I was in like ninth grade, uh, my group of little loser friends in the suburban hell I grew up in. Now, I had a great youth and we, we used to just like hang out like other kids just riding bikes and all this shit and we had this one friend who lived in the neighborhood I, I won't say his name just in case he's out there somewhere but he was like the bad kid like he was just the most unpredictable like he would turn everything we did into like exploding shit and you know he was that kid That's did fun. no supervision just like a, a lunatic he also happened to get me into some music, like, you know, and I was like, oh, this kid's a badass. Here we go. So he um, he got me into like suicide tendencies and things like that. And then he played Carnivore. And, and I remember going, oh my God, what? Like, this is fucking amazing. Like, who, who the hell are these guys and everything they're saying? So I got into Carnivore. And then naturally, the progression was the typo negative, of course. And I got uh, Slow, Deep and Hard. And that album just, oh, yeah, there you go. Ralph, that album just opened up like a world of shit for me. And I happen to be, I'm a huge, I think Steve, I think uh, Peter Steele had one of the greatest voices of anybody in rock and metal. I uh, love him so much and uh, miss him very much. And uh, Slow Deep and Hard was just um, this explosion of of melodic anger. <laughs> and, um, and some of it wasn't very melodic, but it was very, like the keys and the, the whole fuck presentation but it had more fucking rage and like really anti-social lyrics that like appealed to me and appealed to me still. And um, I got to tell you, I love that album so much. Um, it is my favorite typo negative album, despite their, you know, massive commercial success later on. That is my favorite typo album by far unsuccessfully coping with the natural beauty of infidelity. Um, yeah. Without going, without destroying the channel here with the profanity that's that some people complain about um but to just have like a sing songy chorus saying like the worst possible words you know that's <laughs> journey of, you gotta read those lyrics that yeah song. yeah and uh their own term mentioned zero tolerance is basically like killing his girlfriend that cheated on him and her boyfriend i mean for my adolescent uh, self it was forget it but the outdoors to this day i can rock it love it so much hypo name um so Nick, my number two, my number two, my number one could could switch off, man. They really could. But um, I'm gonna go with number two. I'm gonna go with "Blessed Are the Sick" by Morbid Angel. Uh, this album, I've I told this story before on here, but fuck it, I'll tell it again real quick. I didn't know what death metal was really. I had no idea. And one day, a very quiet, um, shy but cool friend of mine 
I was walking, you know, to school, 7.30 in the morning, 10th grade, blah, miserable. And my friend just came up to me. He didn't say anything. And he just put headsets on my head and he played Fall From Grace from this album. And I remember that moment. And I was like, holy shit. That was one of my big oh shit moments that sent me down the path of black and death metal. Can't see anything. Never mind. Um, this is original, though. This is I bought this that year. Um, so it was Relativity and Earache there, 1991. So Morbid Angels, Blessed of the Sick, to me is uh I didn't I didn't have any idea what anything like this could be this evil and um and yet still have like uh Chris Allo was saying, uh I like songs with hooks too. And mm -hmm. this this had that. Every song was distinct. Every song had a climax. Every song had a chorus. Um, even if it was about hellish nether worlds and demonic conjurings, I didn't give a shit. It was amazing. So my number two is uh, Blessed of the Sick. It was incredible artwork. These guys were fucking brilliant. And I say were because I don't know what the hell happened to them. But <laughs> they had a couple more in the bag after that. But I, I got off the boat after... Um, yeah, uh, what's the one? Formula's Fatal of the Flesh. After that, would you still go out? It, no, I like that. And but after that, I got no use for them. But this is a masterpiece. The one before it, all those madness and covenant, um, covenant after three perfect albums in a row to me. So this was where I got on board and uh, can't say enough good things about Blessed of the Sick and lots of virtuoso guitar solos on all those albums, right. <laughs> proving that you can have artistic playing on some of these brutal albums, right? Yep. I like, uh, I know Trey was the main guy in the band and I liked his mentality back then with early Morbid Angel. He's like, we're going to rehearse over and over and we're going to be the best band in the world. And we're going to fucking go up there and kill every other band, like just annihilate them, wipe them off the stage. Like they never even existed. And they were very yeah. serious about it. They took it seriously. They used to make Pete practice drums until like his fucking legs fell off. And uh, you know what? I think it worked because they were one of the best. Yeah, they, and they were very arrogant and all that shit. Sure, but they pulled it off. They were arrogant about it, but they went up there and actually did wipe every band that they played with off the Jesus stage. Christ, you yeah. Know, and you can understand David's word. You can understand what he was saying, and because that's the biggest complaint, you know, with all the plebeians with death metals. I can't understand him. Um, sorry, but uh, you can understand <laughs> this motherfucker, and you can understand uh, him very easily. I agree. Yeah, I, I think for that span of time, for when they when they really got going. And they're for like, uh, it's hard to find another band that was on top of their game like that, you know, especially in uh, in extreme metal. Yep. Right, Craig. All right. I had these originally flip flopped, but I'm, uh, but I put them, I switched them earlier in the day. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, uh, also mirrored what uh, Butch had said earlier. My number, my number uh, three is Badlands Voodoo Highway. Uh, the smooth vocals of the late Ray Gillen, the great guitar work of Jakey Lee on this, uh, just a, just a, a great album. I, I do prefer the original uh, more to this one, and and the overall sound of it is is actually better too. But uh, this is still a great follow up. Uh, favorite songs would probably be Soul Stealer, Whiskey Dust, uh, Love Don't Mean a Thing. And there's even a, a great cover of uh, the shitty James Taylor song, uh, Fire and Rain. But the, the vocals from <laughs> Ray Gillen just, uh, you know, send chills uh, as he's hitting those high notes. So just a, a class album all the way from uh, Badlands Voodoo Highway. My number two, the uh, what I originally had is my number three, but I went with Sepultura's Arise uh, and uh, Dead Embryonic Cells, Altered State, a great cover of Motorhead's Orgasmatron uh, on this and from a bunch of they were still kids pr pretty much basically at the time when, the, uh, when this when this was done, but uh, uh, still rings true. So, you know, 30, 30 what, how many years later uh and seeing seeing these uh seeing the the cavalier brothers perform these songs live was, oh, was, was great was really a, a great. cool a cool thing to see and uh sound almost exactly like the cd from 91 so yeah my number two is arise nice rob <laughs> all right i gotta go back really quick to uh oh. nick's pick about um when he was talking about the song unsuccessfully coping with infidelity, um, here's like a, a thing that was sent out to radio stations. It's a radio friendly single of it, and it's got like beeps every five seconds in it. It's really hilarious. What's the point? The funny thing about this is that uh, I have a friend 
who went to college with Chris and he was in the radio station with him. And every now and again, he'd bring these uh, free CDs back. So I got this probably from the same stuff that Chris was getting it from. Wait, which, gave me, which friend? Scott Eisenberg worked with you there, right? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. I think yeah. that's how come you and my wife became friends on Facebook because he told you that we were in the horror and you were doing the Hudson yeah. Hawk thing. We've been friends for years on Facebook because of that. But yeah, this is actually a CD and it's just so funny. Like it's got three other versions of the song, but you only want to hear the beeping version in here because it's just hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah, then, what? Uh, what they used to do with, with we, uh, this is way back when, and sorry to interrupt Ralph, but they, they had, um, since CDs were new, they only had one CD player in the radio station and they had two turntables. Wow. So like you couldn't play two CDs in a row. So you'd have to play a CD and then go to a turntable and you know back and forth because you couldn't do CD to CD because there was only one CD. And they had one cabinet, one file cabinet with a lock. And so they would lock up the CDs so they wouldn't disappear because CDs were worth something back then. So they would the promo singles, they would just keep, keep hanging around. And then after a couple of weeks, they would just give them away to everybody, uh, you know, just because they then they weren't going to lock them up because they had just one cabinet for for locking up CDs. It was it was very primitive uh, radio back then. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got uh, "Mental Funeral" by Autopsy. Not my favorite album by them, but right up there, probably my second favorite album by them. I love uh, the first album, but uh, just unbelievable, brutal, beautiful brutality. Um, then uh, Suffocation, Effigy of the Forgotten, cloned a million bands after this album came out. The whole like slam core kind of scene, I think it birthed from this album. It is so tight and so heavy. It's uh, and when seeing them live all the time back then, they were to play this kind of music live, they'd be so perfect and tight, it was unbelievable. And that's why they, they blew right up to the top of the, the scene there. And another great debut that came out in 91. Yes, indeed. Oh, so his drumming on that album is just out of this fucking yeah. world. Mike's drumming on that uh, effigy. When, when, I was, when I was a kid back then, I, the Morpheus guys were good friends with them before the album came out. And we were going down to Long Island and seeing them play shows. And we got to go see them open up for death down there. And I got to go into Mike Smith's house and watch them do a rehearsal before they had to play the show. And then we all went over with suffocation to, to the Sundance Pete's old hangout. Yep. And uh, but it was pretty amazing. I got to sit like, like two feet away from Mike Smith and just watch him destroy the drums. And one of the greatest, greatest things I've ever seen with a drummer. That's cool. Yeah. Sundance had a lot of good memories. What, what I do remember. Cause <laughs> those, good, those are some heavy drinking weekends, man. Woo. It's my all time favorite rock club. Is Sundance. Oh, I loved it. Such a cool place. Rob. Hey, uh, well, you know, it was funny what um, Chris was talking about earlier about death metal. I didn't get into death metal either until later in, uh, I would say probably like 2000. Around when Opeth came out, that's when I started to really get into death metal. So most of my picks are going to be pretty much, you know, traditional metal. And these two albums, though, these next two albums for me are they're pretty heavy considering, you know, uh, and and one of them, which is the Human Factor by Metal Church, which is my number three, is, I mean, thrashy. You know, I think Pete's talked about it before on the channel about how. Metal Church can do traditional ballads and stuff like that, but they can do that thrash. And that's really how I got into them because between them and then getting into Overkill and then later on Slayer and everybody in Metallica and all that stuff. I mean, Metal Church is really, for me, was like that, uh, the gateway into the thrash. And this album is, I mean, Mike, Mike Howe sounds incredible on this album. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Every, it sounds so fucking there's good. Not one bad, there's not one bad song on this album. I, I, I listened to it again today for like the fifth time this week. And I just, I just love this album. Just that one bad song on here. In fact, our own Martin Popoff had something to say. It says Canadian journalist Martin Popoff considered the album, the band's masterwork and put metal church on par with Megadeth as metal perfection personified. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so for me, yeah, this is one of their best albums. Uh, one of their best releases. You know, unfortunately, you know, we lost Mike a couple of years ago, but I mean, this album is just incredible. And 
maybe it's underrated in, in, in the metal community. I don't know. For us, not not. But I'm talking about bigger. I think Metal Shirt should be a much bigger band, in my in my opinion. Uh, the next album. Now I know a lot of people don't like this particular person sometimes because of his vocals, but I love Udo. I've always loved Udo from when he was Accept. And Time Bomb is an, another one, a great album, really heavy riffs, a lot of soloing on here. In fact, there's two songs on here that are solos, that, you know, like an eruption kind of thing. And uh, every song on here is kick ass, you know, Metal Eater, Thunder Force, Burning Heat, Back in Pain, uh, The Gutter. I mean, th these are all great songs. And, um, you know, for me, I had, I, I, like I said, I re-listened I re to this album. I hadn't listened to the album in a few years. And I was like, wow, man, this really is good. I mean, Udo was on the top of his game back then. In fact, I think this is even better than some of the newer stuff that he's put out in the last few years, you know, when I when I look back at it. So for me, those are the my uh, three and number two. And a couple of the honorable mentions. I know you guys are like, uh, Pete mentioned Symbol of Salvation. That's, that's on there for me, too. Yeah, he's got a lot of really strong albums, actually. You know, I think if you yes. look at his catalog compared to Accept's catalog, I think especially since they parted ways, I'd argue that he's got more records that are just really, really strong. I mean, Accept has a lot of them, too, but I'd argue his catalog might even be a little bit stronger. So, but... Who doesn't like Udo's voice? Some people that don't. People no, that there, don't. There's people that didn't like... I, They're wrong. I, you know, I remember people saying, who is that? Why is it, you know... They, they no, just, really Scott. I don't know. For me, it, it, it don't sounds, like Udo. It sounds I more metal like than Udo. I just said he reminded me of Bon Scott. Oh, he does. He definitely has that that nasal, that gravelly thing. But yeah, I think I mean, the reason like, why they were never bigger here in the states is because of his voice. Because it's, I could, it's, I could see that. I mean, that's one of his best too. albums too. Time Bomb is yeah. a fuck. That's a heavy album. Yeah, yeah. that's a really yeah. heavy album. Yeah, but then I mean, they did replace him, and they didn't. They went even worse, you know. They they did even <laughs> shittier than with him. So yeah, they stayed the course on that. Some of that '90s stuff is kind of like oof, you know. All right, Bryce. All right, like uh, Craig, I also have Arise on my list at number three. Great classic album for me. It's pretty much the last Sepultura album that I care about. Um, Chaos AD, Chaos AD is all right, and then they went to shit with Roots, trying to sound like Corn. But uh, to me, it's unbelievable. I wasn't really around for all this or didn't pay attention. I don't know how the heck the Cavalera brothers don't have the Sepultura name, but it's just an absolute travesty that they don't. I saw them play at uh, Maryland Death Fest last year. They played some songs from this album, and it was killer, just amazing. Yeah, one of the craziest crowds I've been in. Uh, the title track's awesome. Dead Embryonic Cells, Desperate Cry, a couple of my favorites. Uh, my number two, the album on Mr. Franco's shirt there. I got... Uh, <laughs> Night of the Storm Rider, Iced Earth. He knows what's up. It's a great album. A lot of times I've said this is my favorite Iced Earth album, even though, you know, it's got John Greeley on vocals, not their classic guy. It's the only album with him on vocals. But to me, the songs uh, are great, right? I mean, he's, he's so, a good vocalist, too. He, he is good. He, great. he does good on it. John Schaefer, you know, his riffs are just amazing. That He's so fast with his galloping, riffing. Uh, to me, I've always kind of thought it was like Iron Maiden on steroids, just that galloping, fast-paced thing there. A lot of these songs are, you know, they did them on uh, Live in Athens, the like kind of classic staple version of them. But Angels Holocaust, Storm Rider, The Path I Choose, Mystical End, Desert Rain, Pure Evil, Travel and Stygian, all these songs are just amazing. So this is definitely up there for me at number two, Night of the Storm Rider. Can I get an amen? Heck amen. yeah. <laughs> Great album. All right, Ryan. All right, well, both of these were mentioned, but fuck it. I'm going to talk about them again because I love them. Uh, number three for me is, Ralph mentioned it, it's Autopsy, uh, Mental Funeral. This is my favorite Autopsy album. And these guys, it's like a perfect mix of the sludginess and the heaviness of old Black Sabbath. It has the feel of Black Sabbath. It's got that sludgy evilness, yeah. a little Celtic Frost Hellhammer. They got that worked yeah. in there, too. And then they just kind of did their own thing. They have a lot. Of, they have the style that's that's like loose and like like clattering, but it's it, they're damn good musicians too. So they kind of thread the needle on it. Like Chris Reifert, drummer and vocalist, very distinct, awesome voice. You can tell what he's singing, but he's like the sickly, like he's vomiting the whole time. It doesn't sound like a pig squealing or like crickets, like a lot of these new bands. Uh, just awesome vocals, great drummer. 
Uh, not super fast. It kind of has this, you know, it starts and stops. It has these lurches. Very good. Just great songwriters. Uh, their first album, Severed Survival, is awesome, too. But this one's always been my favorite. I just love this artwork. Uh, it's just nasty, evil. It's like, the, it's like a tetanus wound of death metal. That's how I always thought of these guys. And they're one of the best at it. And this is, to me, their best album. So this is a great year for death metal. So we're going to keep that going. One of my favorite death metal albums ever from Sweden. Their debut album, uh, I think the best thing they ever did, and they did a lot of good albums, is, Nick's mentioned this before, uh, Like an Everflowing Stream by Dismember. And like Nick said, this album, it's like a it's like a thousand bulldozers just running your head over, but it's melodic, <laughs> it's well-produced. It has, there's definitely like a, a classic Swedish death metal sound. Uh, they used the HM2 pedal. Uh, they all recorded at the same studio, a lot of them back then. So there's definitely like, especially when it comes to the guitar tone, you can definitely tell there's continuity between a lot of these bands. You can kind of tell they were all like, I want to say copying each other, but they all kind of came up from the same set of influences and the same sound. And uh, Dismember was one of the earliest bands. A lot of the guys started off in this earlier band called Carnage, uh, which that was uh, one of the members was Michael Amit, who later went on to be in Carcass and Arch Enemy and so on and so forth. But uh, these guys broke off and started Dismember early on. And they put out this in 91. Just awesome. Like to me, this is... There's a, there's a million, obviously, Entombed, Unleashed, Grave. There's a lot of cool bands at the gates. A lot of bands came out of that world. There's still bands today. Some bands, like In Flames and At the Gates, went on to like do their own you know, other stuff. It's not really death metal anymore. Uh, but if I had to recommend one album, say this is, to me, the definitive classic Swedish death metal album, full stop. Uh, there's a couple contenders, for sure. But to me, the answer is uh, like an ever-flowing stream. This is definitely number one in that in that realm. Uh, just just one of the best death metal albums ever. And of course, it's got the great artwork on the back. These guys are all soaked in blood, upside down cross there. You know, just death metal as fuck. Just a, such a good album. And they're the nicest guys you ever want to meet. Yeah, I would don't doubt that at all, you know. And Two uh, up, man. I, I had this on earlier when we were talking, you know, we're discussing the music for the show and you know, kind of getting some ideas. I threw this album on. I'm like, man, every single time I hear this, it's so fucking good. It's just that opening riff from uh of uh override of the overture hits and you just want to you know all the classics flip tables run through walls smash your head through shit uh all those great emotions that this stuff makes you feel right in your heart uh these guys definitely captured it on the sound so yep. so so many bands if i may say right so many bands try so hard to bring all the modern studio tricks and all they try as hard as they can to can't capture like that the level of murderous razor sharp fucking brutality and they it's, fail it's tough. and these guys uh, and, you, and like you guys said, a couple of guys said it, you could be the fastest band on the fucking planet. You got to write a goddamn song. You have to write songs. You got to have hooks. Otherwise, you just sound like a fucking lawnmower. Uh, uh, and I'll I'll say, because you know, I do like some bands that sound like a lawnmower. I was going to say, I'll, you do like lawnmowers, right? <laughs> I know. I'm not a, I'm not opposed to that, but... Catchy lawnmower. You really you really yeah. want a song, you know? And I don't care if you're the Rolling Stones, you're just a member. You yeah. got to write a goddamn song. And these, it's, these guys, as fast and as heavy as they were, uh, this album's full of great songs that get stuck in your head, you know, if you're into death metal. But, you know, really, they are great classic death metal songs. And these guys were very, very good at it, especially on their first album. So, I mean, who doesn't love a melodic lawnmower, right? My Husqvarna is quite yeah. It's just it's like, man, this music to my ears right there. Just yeah. mowing the lawn, yeah. trimming the edges. That's it. All right, Chris, your next two picks. All right, yeah. Uh, next two picks are, are definitely two bands that I really liked in 1991, and uh, I definitely on the on my list of bands I thought might have went somewhere, but really didn't. Uh, number number three is uh, from Deaf American Records, the debut record from, uh, and I'm a, I'm a big wrestling fan. So when I, as soon as I saw the 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 night the name of this band doing college radio, I'm like, oh, I gotta fucking hear it. The Four Horsemen. Uh, so uh, they were on Deaf American Records. They were kind of like uh, hard rock, bluesy hard rock, you know, meets Southern rock, had members of like the cult and ex-members of the cult and, and uh, Zodiac Mind Warp. The drummer was the brother of Chuck Biscuits from Danzig. Uh, I really dug it. Uh, I love the singer, Frank Starr. Uh, Rockin' is my business and business is good. It's like the fucking greatest song ever. Uh, but man, they just, they just went nowhere, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, shit happens was the 90s. Uh, similarly, my number two was a record I fucking totally loved. Uh, had members, ex-members of MOD, Celtic Frost, uh, Uniform Choice, uh, Pete, your buddy, uh, Reed St. Mark, uh, and Mindfunk. 
Uh, they were like a really weird kind of couldn't put your finger on it, finger on it, like. But they were like I thought perfect for the time because they were that sort of alternative metal thing going on. Yeah. Um, man, I used to play that "Sugar Ain't So Sweet" and "Touch You," uh, and I got a dirty version of "Touch You" um, from the <laughs> from the fucking uh, from Epic Records. And I remember buying. You know, they, they were doing. I guess things were already getting weird in 1991 with the labels trying to push bands. I remember going about going to Tower Records in Yonkers to buy the CD because I had heard the promo at the radio station and they had a um, a t-shirt shrink wrapped and taped to the CD. So every CD you bought, you got a free t-shirt. Of course it was, you know, one size fits some, even in 1991, I was too fucking fat to wear that thing, but it was cool, I got a free t-shirt. Uh, but anyway, that's my, my number two, uh, the debut record from Mindfunk. There was so much buzz about cool. that band. They just never went anywhere. <sighs> just fucking never went anywhere. I probably bumped it. I probably bumped it to you, Chris. I didn't even know you. Because I didn't oh, know sure. you. They were, we were probably at a ton of places, tons of shows. I used to go to that Tower Records all the time. Oh, it was great. It was so convenient, right on Central Avenue. And they always had stock. Wow. That was the thing. Of course. Always. That was their thing. And they had that huge video store underneath, man. And they had laser discs. I was a laser disc collector. Those were tough. To, those were tough to find in, in the in the wild, as the kids say. <laughs> as the kids say. <laughs> All right, Butch. His next two picks. He's got number three. He's got uh, "Bad Motor Finger" by Soundgarden, and number two, "Mashuga Contradictions Collapse," which, uh, for those of you who had never heard that album, that is a really thrashy album from Mashuga. Very different from the stuff that kind of came afterwards, but uh, definitely good stuff. All right, my number three, I am also going to pick uh, Soundgarden, Bad Motor Finger. I think Soundgarden were, them and Alice in Chains were the best bands to come out of Seattle around this time. And I I never saw either one really as a grunge band. They were, they were both metal bands in my mind. And I think uh, Bad Motor Finger is just a terrific kind of like stoner rock album or stoner metal album. Really, really good. Um, Chris Cornell is off the charts on that. Kim Thales' guitar riffs are just amazing. Just a, easily their best album. And then my number two is Streets, a rock opera by Sabotage. Uh, you know, at the time, I didn't like this nearly as much as the albums that came before, but I've grown to really love this album quite a bit. There's some great stuff on here. This is Sabotage doing more of kind of like, oh, it's a rock opera, right? So it's a little bit more theatrical, but there's still some great heavy stuff on here. I mean, Jesus Saves is so good. Um, Can You Hear Me Now is great. Ghost in the Ruins got some great riffs and great guitar work from Chris Oliva. And I always love John Oliva's voice. So uh, yeah, terrific album. That's number two for me. And uh, back to Karen for number one. All right. Number one is... Billy Childish and the Head Coats, Head Coatitude. Billy Child Childish is a prolific artist. He uh, is a writer, a poet, a painter. Um, he's got a million bands. Uh, the Head Coats, the Milkshakes, the Mighty Caesars, they're all great, uh, predominantly garage and garage punk. And that is the Head Coats. Head Coatitude is awesome songs maybe three and a half minutes tops very primitive very very primitive i cannot stress it enough this is lo-fi shit at it is best it's the best it's the best um my favorite tracks are my dear watson it's gonna hurt you more than it's gonna hurt me um basic stripped down rock and roll that's what this is. That's what Garage Punk is. And it's rocks my world. That's it. That's my number one. And I, I couldn't wait to share this with you guys because uh, I I just really love Billy Childish and that record and the head coats are awesome. And um, it was so refreshing and new to me, even though it was literally lifted from like 1966. I mean, the sound is so lo-fi but uh it really affected me in a, a great way and uh helped make me the human that i am today so i just wanted to share i couldn't wait to say it because we never talked about that kind of music and it meant a lot to me so i'm gonna listen to that later head coat the head coated too the head coats 
head coated to. You're gonna have to text it to me because my I will. Is, <laughs> I'll do it. It's like yeah. a sock holding water. It's just it's pumped. great. It's, it's great. It's just and like I said, he's got a million bands, but in 1991 he was with the head coats and that that record. Cool. Uh, Nick, your number one. Right. My number one. Spoiler alert. You're number one. I figured it was <laughs> spoiler alert, bro. <laughs> Uh, the original artwork, the best artwork, Night of the Storm Rider. I did not get in on the ground floor with this. I should I should say that up front. Um, I first heard Ice Earth in 1995 when, and remember, my, my origin story with heavy metal is coming into it just as all of these amazing bands were, let's see, either losing members, shitting the bed, going commercial, all that, yielding to grunge, whatever it was metal to me i was like oh i see so bands get really good and then they then they cut their hair and suck like that was my little worldview <laughs> um one band after band just punched me right in the balls so by the time 94 95 rolled around i was well and truly into the the extreme stuff and i had gotten into the century media record label via um bands like sentenced and moonspell and then um i discovered iced earth just because they were on the label and the and the fucking artwork was amazing um and i got burnt offerings and i got this album and i was like holy shit there's still bands that make like amazing uh traditional metal like if they're not they don't give a fuck what's going on commercially they're gonna keep on doing this so as uh bryce i believe said before like yeah the, the, the this shit is like it's like number of the beasts that are made mixed with metallica just with that thrash and yeah, they had a lot of members that they didn't keep for long, especially John Greeley on vocals. But the strength of the songs, as was noted earlier, is just forget it. I mean, this is just hit after hit after hit. I listened to the original version over the past couple of days and I'm you know trying to say, like, I right, pretend like you don't know it again. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, song after song after song after song is amazing. This shirt I got in the 90s and it was 100,000 sizes too big for me. I was like 160 pounds back then. And this shirt was made for like, you know, a giant trucker who also played football. <laughs> you know, all these shirts were just XXX. So I still rock this thing, but it's like swims on me. Um, I wish I had that problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I still gained a little belly. I'm here, with you, Chris. But tough but, being yeah, a so, big man in a small man's world. <laughs> so I start just meant so much to me. Did, did are we doing um honorables at the next mention. yeah we'll circle back around if anybody has all right so yeah so ice earth my favorite cool great album craig all right chris you son of a bitch you stole my thunder but i still love you but, uh, oh. I'm, going, but I'm going with uh the four well, horsemen uh so nobody awesome. said it was easy uh just i think really just takes bands that sounded similar to them that bluesy hard rock sound and they just whipped them at their own game uh on this uh frank star uh, uh may he rest in peace had a uh great voice and he could transition from a smooth sounding ballad to a uh on a song like tired wings but the, and then would just uh belt out like a screaming vocal on a on a song like looking for trouble uh, a lot of tragedy with this band. Uh, the uh, as Chris had mentioned, the uh, drummer was uh, Chuck Biscuit's brother. He died after uh, this album between between uh, the time of their follow up album, which took four years. Frank Starr uh, served two two different terms in in prison. Uh, hence the the break in in their uh, output till till their second album came out, which by that time in '95, the music industry had changed a lot. Two months after that album, Frank Starr was uh, hit by a drunk driver on his mo while on a motorcycle, and he went into a coma and uh, eventually died. So uh, there's always a lot of talk. We we, we all do it with uh, bands that coulda, shoulda, woulda, but for whatever reason didn't. And uh, I always have uh, Four Horsemen at the at uh, up amongst the top of, of them. Funny thing is, for this album. There are five guys in the Four Horsemen, but, uh, but the, it uh, but it is a, a great album. Check it out. Uh, produced by Rick Rubin on Deaf American. Uh, again, as Chris had said, they have had a lot of things going for them, but just uh, things just didn't work out for them, and a lot of tragedy along the way. But a great rock and roll document uh, for for everyone still to enjoy. Nobody said it was easy. Cool. 
Rob. I thought it was Ralph. Oh. I think we went out of Ralph. order last time. Oh. Uh, number guess. one. You know, this was this is tough, but and and it wasn't because for me, um at that time, I remember I was uh, going through something, and uh, for some reason, this album though got me through it, and that was uh, Ozzy Osbourne's "No More Tears." I mean, Ozzy to me, Godfather of metal and all that, but this album is still to this day one of my favorite Ozzy Al Osbourne albums. You know, considering, uh, and you know, Zach was on this. Lemmy wrote actually wrote what six or seven songs on this but only four were actually on the album which is surprising when i think about it you know <laughs> and in fact let me help write my mom I'm coming home i mean and all the songs on here are pretty good i mean there's not one really bad song on here uh so i mean i, I don't want to repeat all the songs but i went quadruple platinum uh the album was the biggest thing probably that year on, on the radio probably next to maybe the other band that nobody's even mentioned yet and that's metallica but uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to talk about. The, yeah, I didn't want to talk about the black album. Yeah, talk about bands we never heard of here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and um, I mean, Ozzy sounded so good on this, you know, and uh, I just, you know, it just brings back a lot of good memories. I was, I, I was working up in um, Bedford Hills at the time, so I was taking the train. And I used to listen to this like every day with my headphones on, and it just took me away. You know, and and Zach's guitar playing on here on here was great. great. I mean, this this you know this was this was when Zach was really good. I mean, Black Label's great and everything. I I I you know I've been to many of those shows, but back when he was with Ozzy in those days, uh, it was it was awesome. So anyway, that that's my number one for uh, for ninety one. Yeah. Ralph. Okay, my number one is was Nick's number two. Blessed Art is Sick, Morbid Angel, just an absolute masterpiece, like he was saying. Um, seeing them live back then, there was no one touched them. They were so tight for playing such intricate music, like just the way Suffocation was. They both pulled it off live, unbelievably. Every time I seen them back then, the play those sharper leads and that intricate and hear it that clearly. And here, his vocals are so brutal, but you like he, you said, you could hear every word really even with those crazy lyrics that nobody else wrote lyrics like that such an important album it just was so perfect to me i always go back and forth between that and altars of madness which my favorite is but i think the production was a little bit better on on blessed order six so my number one album of the year absolute masterpiece nice bryce you're number one bryce, all right my number one uh was also already mentioned horoscope by overkill fantastic album super heavy seen them four or five times live and they're always great i think the last time actually was with a couple of y'all uh nick yeah. ryan karen uh i think that was the first time i met ryan in person i had to drive him to the hospital because he fell in the pit we, you know something like that you know? first time i met you you were like <laughs> we had fun walked into that i thought you got walked into the wrong airbnb i opened the bathroom door and there i was like who is this guy why is he here yeah, <laughs> Nick brought me over over Karen was i stepped over to claim him i'm like i claim this young yeah. guy yeah. he's with <laughs> us he's he's he belongs with us yeah that was yeah. a fun trip <laughs> yeah that was awesome um uh, great show they're always awesome live uh, of course bobby gustafson not in the band anymore but they got some great guitar players doing good work on here Come was awesome. The title track, Nice Day for a Funeral. Masterpiece of an album. It's definitely my favorite by Overkill. They're one of the most consistent thrash bands. This one is my favorite, though. And uh, I will say my favorite song from 1991, though, is not on an album. It's on a soundtrack, and that is Go to Hell by Megadeth on the Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. All right. Soundtrack, I just wanted to throw that out there. Best song for me of 91. I love that song, Bryce. That song. It's top five Megadeth song, and they're the greatest band to ever exist. So, <laughs> got to mention it. Well, I mean, they're no Wasp, but oh you know, god, hey, don't well, get it it's too true. Too. Yeah. Blackie does have no. Bryce voice. has been plotting for weeks. It's like, well, damn, Wasp and Megadeth didn't release an album in '91, so I got to get. One I had to get it in there somehow, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Ryan. All right. Well, we got a special guest appearance here, real quick. I didn't want to stop by. Uh, uh oh. All right. So, uh, <laughs> Scow is in here. He's off seeing bands in some uh, Chinese basement restaurant in Brooklyn. So, 
Uh, let's see who we're going to talk about for 1991. Oh, Metallica. Oh, I guess our favorite album is going to be Nevermind by Nirvana because I killed all that dumb hair metal shit. So, anyway, so. <laughs> That's funny. Somebody's going to get in trouble for that. Oh, no. Somebody's going to get in trouble. That's going out over the whole internet. Everyone's going to oh, see. Boy. There's going to be a flaming oh, bag of poo on your front door. I anticipate it. <laughs> all right. So, my real pick is. Uh, I do like Nirvana, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so my real pick is, so let's see, I went to New Jersey. We went to Oakland, California so far, Australia, and Sweden. So now we're going to go over to the Czech Republic for an album that nobody picked. But I talked about it on the show before, and I talked about the guitarist, and I'm going to talk about him again because of his very <clears throat> distinct name. Uh, so black metal, obviously, you know, got famous when it moved to Norway and Scandinavia in the early 90s, and you had church burnings and murders and stuff, which brought in a lot of notoriety and fame. And a lot of those bands were great, but it didn't start there. It started in other places. And one of the first bands that really kind of invented, like when you think of the modern black metal sound, was a little band from a Czech Republic called Master's Hammer. Uh, and this was their first album, Ritual. And these guys, it, it took like, it's a, it's a combination of like really dark thrash metal like kind of like creator sodom destruction uh and a lot of what celtic cross are doing like the, you know especially like celtic cross to like the megatherion like the big timpani drums like this big not symphonic but like it's very like orchestral you know there's like a lot of shit going on uh and just this weird sound that nobody else really sounded like they you know i, I hear this album and uh it just sounds like master's hammer like they just kind of did their own thing even though i'm comparing it to some other bands uh, all the lyrics are in Czech, which I do not speak, so I could translate it when I have, but, you know, at the top of my head, it's like, you know, you do, when you're listening to the album, I have no idea what the fuck they're singing about. Uh, the guitarist, his name, I'll bring it up, his name is uh, is uh, Necrocock. Yep, that's his good oh, Christian name. this guy, okay. Yeah, good old ne uh -huh. Necrocock. Necrocock shows up again. <laughs> Necrocock. <laughs> Necro, he's back, but... Uh, uh, no, it's it's not it's it's oh, halfway yeah, it's like it's like a meeting point between like <laughs> 80s bands like venom and bathory and you know celtic frost like a lot of that 80s stuff and then you think of like 90s bands like you know emperor and mayhem dark from like all these 90s <clears throat> black metal bands from scandinavia uh you listen to this album and you can see that's that's where this became that and a lot of the scandinavian bands like the norwegian bands fucking love this they worship this shit so it's easy to see they took influence from this and venom and motorhead and slayer and all those other bands but yeah this is just a, such a great album uh, right after they released this they put out another album and they immediately start getting weird like they started off as a weird band so they just kept that trajectory going and then like by the third or fourth album like they weren't even a metal band anymore it was like this weird electronic kind of rock just you know i, I wasn't really into them at that point I, that later stuff kind of lost me but their first earliest albums and the demos are great, but this first album ritual is it's fucking special. It's really there's almost nothing like it. Uh it's not really it's kind of lo-fi, but not really. You know, it's got a, like let's say the timpani drums, like all this big orchestration. Uh it's easy to listen to, it's very catchy. Uh, even though I don't speak Czech, I don't understand the lyrics, but you know, it just you don't really need to speak a language to enjoy music. You know, I never I never thought I that. So yeah, to right. me, this is this is an awesome album. Uh just I can't recommend songs because again, the the, lyrics, the the song titles are all in check, but it's easy to find. It's not hard album to track down these days. It's been reissued a couple of times. You can find it on YouTube, you know, all that stuff. So uh yeah, great band. They only played the US once, which I believe was Maryland Death Fest 2018. Uh so of course I fucking went to that because they didn't play shows for a long time. They really were in a live band and they put a live lineup together. And I'm like, there's no way in fuck they're ever going to come to America because they're just too obscure and too European. But no, they came, they played that one festival and it was fucking amazing. And it was really, really good. It was really yeah. good. It made the whole fest for me. I just stood there with like, uh, you know, just watching. <laughs> when you get to feel like this, you know, especially when you're into this kind of metal. Uh, there's been a whole pile of bands you're like i love this band but i'm just never gonna see them they're never gonna play the united states like only 20 people know about them they're from some far off part of the world why would they ever come here and play for us and like you know here but every now and then it happens and it happened with these guys and then they broke up after that so you know i count my blessings i saw that one show here it was really good so number one for me 1991 is master's hammer ritual check it out good out oh yeah very cool Chris. let's keep it with number one yeah Fuck you, scouts or something. <laughs> I'm sure I'll hear all about that. Well, that was <laughs> coming. 
It's coming. It's coming. Be on, he'll never be on here again. <laughs> it's, it's the big oh, one. I, lo oh, I love you, Steve. Big goofball. He, he right, Chris, say it one more me. time because he doesn't believe you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> like All right, Chris, what do you got? Number one. Uh, my number one uh, is a band that I, I had liked before, but uh, this record completely blew me away in uh, 1991. Um, I remember when they were they had a buzz on them. Again, another band that should have been huge with this record. I remember College Music Journal had like a fold out poster when this was being released. And um, uh, I always rem I remember the tagline because I had the poster on my wall for years. It said, if Public Enemy made a Black Sabbath record. I'm not sure if I would use that to describe it, but uh, the record is blind. Uh, from Corrosion of Conformity. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh huh. I just absolutely yes. love that record. Good record. Um, you know, their earlier stuff was definitely more, you know, yeah. hardcore crossover stuff. This was, they got a new singer. They went in a way more metallic direction. It was still heavy, but also melodic at times. And, uh, you know, songs like Damned for All Time, Dance of the Dead, Vote with a Bullet. Uh, it just completely blew me away. It is, this record, I st of the of these five, I still less listen to this record all the time. This is without a doubt in my top seven or eight albums of all time. Uh, I, I absolutely love, love, love this record. Um, you know, I've got every record they've done, seen them a million times, but to me, this was their peak. Uh, and it's a shame that things didn't work out for them. That they, you know, they're still around, but uh, they could have, you know, they could have really blown up i thought with this record it just didn't happen yeah their next two i thought were also going to do really really well and i think they did better but yeah they never became that big band that i think a lot of us thought. i don't i i think it would be really hard for a band like coc because at the time um i mean they were just so well known as a, a like a an original hardcore band then they became into then they went into crossover i don't know how many like me when i knew heard they were doing metal i was like fuck this i don't need coc to do metal i wanted them to do that like i wasn't going to follow them into metal i was in a whole other punkosphere at that time you know what i'm saying so could they really i mean didn't a lot of metal heads associate them at that time with punk and i, I, mean, I went to see them on that tour and i it was before the internet and i didn't have the album and I had right. never seen TLC before, and Animosity is one of my favorite crossover albums at the time. Right, and right. They were opening up for they were opening up for like GBH, and then we got there, and that singer came out, and they didn't play any of the classic songs. Right. And me and all my friends were like, "What the fuck?" It was like the, yes. the biggest <laughs> we didn't really give it a chance because we were there thinking we were going to get the classic, and then years and years later, in like 2007, COC came around while Pepper was doing the Down tour. And yeah. COC did like seven shows and they did animosity in its entirety. And it made my, my world because I finally got to see him doing with Mike Dean singing. But yeah. I like it now going back. It's I think it's cool now going back. But at the time it was like, wow, what the hell is this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, I saw them twice in 92, once opening for the Rollins band and uh, once opening for Trouble. It was it was part of the College Music Journal. It was it was yeah. Trouble, COC and Sacred Reich. And they oh, went over yeah. great with the metal crowd. And uh they did. They went over really good with the metal crowd. Yeah. I mean, they were on a metal show, you know, right. playing for, for metal fans. Unfortunately, we did not get it, but in 1992, uh the the uh Fear of the Dark tour was Iron Maiden, uh Testament, and Corrosion of Conformity, which was supposed to play New York in July of 1992, but never happened. But they COC did that whole tour. It's um, so, so weird I mean, they... to even, like, I know I love COC, like, metal stuff now, but at the time, it was just so, it was such a foreign concept that they were going to, they were playing metal. Uh, that I was mean, a big change for them, but, they, you know, oh. it, it seemed to kind of work, but, yeah, and now yeah, I like Deliverance, they, they lost Carl Agalon vocals, Deliverance sold even better, but, yeah, they changed style-wise again. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, then the, the follow ups just went went south from there, unfortunately. Right. Even though they, they were great, they the just name. I wish, they didn't I sell. Wish the name would have changed at the time. I would have accepted it more as a different exactly than as COC. But I agree with you. You know, the weirdest thing not to not to take this totally off topic, but I I remember it was I think 2017 
Um, in the same year, I saw three different lineups of Corrosion of Conformity because I saw the three piece of Corrosion of Conformity uh, without Pepper as opening for Guar in Philadelphia. Uh, a couple months later, I saw Corrosion of Conformity Blind was the name of the band, which had Carl Agle and uh, Reed Mullen on drums and three other guys. And then Corrosion of Conformity reunited with Pepper the same year. So I saw the same year, three different lineups of the same band. Holy shit. The first. That's not right. That's not right. I stand by that. I, that's not. That's not. Gotta make a buck, man. Baby's gotta eat. I know. I know it's true. <laughs> and you know, a lot of times, this is all these guys know how to do. I don't know. When I saw COC at Desert Fest, um, uh, Mike Dean was back and he wow. looked like, whoa, like he just crawled like a dust bunny <laughs> out of a, like a carpet, like a throw rug. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mike, Mike rejoined in uh, he just 92 like, or 93. Oh, I think. like a dust bunny, like, like pig pen. That, that is the image. All, I will like, not get out of my head. Like, like pig pen. <laughs> it was bad. I was like, I don't know. I don't know the guy. Is. What the hell? It's crazy. All right, which is number one is Horoscope by Overkill. And my number one is not my favorite album by this band, but it's a great album, and it's, it's such an important album, not only in the evolution of this band, but I think in, for death metal as a whole, and that's uh, Human by Death. I prefer the couple ones that came after it, but man, this lineup and just, it's like all of a sudden this band just decided to like up the musicality of everything they were doing to like 15 and uh, just some great, great stuff on here. Flattening of emotions, lack of country, comprehension, cosmic sea. I mean, the whole album is just really, really great. So like, tight and technical and the guitar playing is like off the charts and uh yeah the drums just, too is yeah oh, out of this world out of control yeah Which just so good. good i mean you know this album did so much for progressive and technical death metal it's like one of the most important albums uh for that style in general so uh yeah that's my number one so all right let's uh because we're running late and chris and i still have another show to do after this so let's rip through honorables if you got them real quick Real quick, Mary, what do you got? My 1991 doom metal dump: Cathedral, Force Equilibrium, Melvin's, Bullhead, Sleep, Volume One. Then I'm going to say, oh, and also, uh, Solitude Eternus. Yes. Into the depths of sorrow. You can't you cannot say that? Also, Jesus Lizard, Goat, Public Enemy, Apocalypse '91, The Enemy Strikes Black, bitches, and My Bloody Valentine, Loveless. There you go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, what do you got? Big time Sepultura Arise and Carcass Necroticism. I spent a lot of that year listening to those things. Um, I am on the Nirvana Nevermind train. I definitely love that when it came out, so I gotta give it love. Sorry, Bryce. Uh, um <laughs> that's a blow it. Yeah, it came out. I was like, oh, this what is the fun. hell? I don't yeah, know. I didn't I, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um and then uh, I got to give love to um, the proto black metal that was just taking shape. Um, we had Sarcophago with the Laws of Scourge, Samuel Worship Him, and Bathory Twilight of the Gods on the Viking front. Those three bands were rapidly creating the laying down what would become black metal, and they they deserve all the credit in the world. Uh, Entombed, Clandestine, Autopsy, Mental Funeral, um, Razor, Open Hostility, Coroner, Mental Vortex, Death, Human. Pestilence, Testimony of the Ancients, Skyclad, The Wayward Sons of Mother Earth, Sentenced, Shadows of the Past, Wrong, Prove You Wrong, Malevolent Creation, The Ten Commandments, and Lorena McKennett, The Visit, who's a folk singer from Canada, who I love. Fuck. All right. Cool. All right, Lorena. Great. All right, I got uh, Kicks, Hotwire, Glam Metal Be Damned. This is a great rock and roll album. Uh, go get it. Kicks, Hotwire. Uh, I agree with, uh, with Rob. Uh, Metal Churches, Human Factor, uh, Date with Poverty, great song, but and, and a really great album. And even though there's a couple dud tracks on it, I go with Motorhead 1916 as a as an honorable mention, and I dedicate I'm so bad, baby, I don't care to Count Ralphus. All right, babe. <laughs> That's great, I love that Motorhead album. I'm freaking totally bummed that I forgot all about it. <laughs> so many. Yeah. Rob, what do you got? You got any left, Rob? Yeah, Armored Saint, Symbol of the Salvation, 
Typo, slow, deep, and hard. Motorhead, 1916. Skid Row, Slaves to the Grind. And Ice Earth, of course, as, as uh, Nick is wearing there. Those mm -hmm. are my honorable mentions. Mm -hmm. Ralph. Right, like last time we did one of these, I had a whole page full of stuff, but uh, I flashed a bunch of them that people have been saying, and uh, I'll try to be quick with this, but uh, General Surgery, Necrology, uh, some more Swedish uh, bands, like Ryan was saying about uh, Dismember, but here's a couple more great debuts. The First Grave, Into the Grave, Unleashed, Where No Life Dwells. Um, here's a pungent stench being caught buttering. I'm wearing a, a vintage 1991 t-shirt. Don't pull on it. <laughs> it might fall oh, apart. Right? <laughs> you gotta be gentle with those old ones. Oh, really? yeah. Debut considered dead. Mortician. Dark uh, Dark Throne. Oh, that that Dark Throne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great, great cover. Great cover too. Devastation. Idolarity. Uh, Dark Angel. Time to the heel. Atheist. Unquestionable presence. Ah. The sea. Slug of the corpse. Mm, Demolition geez, Hammer, Tortured good. Existence, Therion. Ah, Therion. Holy shit. Pestilence, <laughs> Testimony of the Ancients, Cantor, That Shall Rise, Benediction, The Grand Leveler, uh, Voivod, Angel Rat, Paradise Lost, Gothic. Yeah. Mm. War, oh, America up. Must Be Destroyed. Pit Shifter, Industrial. Yeah, another good one. Primus, Sailing, Sailing the Seas of Cheese. And one of my only other punk ones is uh, Jello Biafra Meets No Means No. And uh, Ratos <laughs> de Parole in Arctophobia. I only have the cassette I lost the cover. And that's it. Cool. Damn. Bryce, <laughs> make it put all those away. Uh, yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> They'd better than putting the vinyl away. I that's true. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'll just stick with ones nobody's mentioned yet. I've got Dancing on Coals by Bang Tango, some more glamish type metal. They kind of had like a funky element to them too, which made them kind of unique. Yeah. Uh, Hellacious Acres by Dangerous Toys. Oh, Love wow. this band. First couple are great. Uh, I got some Anacrusis Manic Impressions. Great progressive thrash. Um, what Goes Around Comes Around by Tough. Got to throw out some more glam metal. Uh, Hooked by Great White. And one really underrated uh, thrash one I wanted to mention is um, this band from Brazil. Got to find them here. Uh, they're called the The Mist. They sound like Sepultura, kind of. The Hangman Tree, really cool underrated album. So check that out if you like Sepultura. But uh, yeah, everybody else mentioned my other ones. So that's all I got. Cool. Right. Uh, well, I didn't want. I didn't feel like pulling a shit ton of albums out, so I kept it pretty simple. Uh, Nick mentioned this, but going down to Brazil, Sarcophago, Laws of Scourge, just great primitive evil South American metal. Uh, Giamat from uh, Sweden, they started off as a death metal band, uh, but on this album, the second album, Astral Sleep, yeah. actually more like a Riding Christ, Celtic Frost, like a doomy, gothic, I don't know, great album, really good. And then they ended up becoming almost like a rock band later on, but this album yeah. is fucking great. That shit rules, I can't believe I forgot that. And I'm going to pick something that I don't think probably like 10 people on the planet have heard of, but I don't give a fuck. Uh, going over to Poland, a uh, great band called Imperator, Time Before Time. Just awesome, like, mix of, like, death metal, thrash metal, uh, like a lot of these cool bands, you know, still primitive death metal, like when it was kind of crossing over to uh, the original. I don't even know if you can find it, so this is a reissue. Uh, awesome, awesome band. And my last one, because I do like it a lot, and I'm going to fuck, is that. <laughs> uh, all uh, That's all I got. Uh, I don't know if anybody mentioned it, but Victims of Deception by uh, Heathen, another one I wanted to. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Good one, Bryce. That's a good one. That's a good one. What about Mister Bungle? Didn't they have a record? Uh, someone, anybody? I think the I think first one was in the nineties. No, oh, that was that was on the that was on the other show. Sorry, George. George was talking about that on uh, in the product seat that we taped before this one. Oh. Steve don't got no honorables either. Uh, <laughs> I want to keep that around. Keep it around. Oh, yeah. I'm going to put it right next to It'll be right here waiting for us. not going to be good. Ah, let's oh, go. Wow. Make That's why I did it. On the Rose, I sense a Hudson Valley Square Civil War coming up. <laughs> I know. It's a drama. <laughs> but then again, if he doesn't watch it, he'll never know. I'm not yeah. saying a word. I'm, I'm not saying a word either. It'll let it happen organically. You know? Yeah. 
on that trail. I see him all the time at pinball, and he's always complaining to me about it anyway, so I don't want to have any part of it. I'll just watch. There you go. <laughs> You're going to hear it whether you want to or not. I know. All right, Chris, you got any honorables? Are you kidding? <laughs> Everything's been mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could make up some shit. Come on. Yeah. Oh, make up some shit. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, they, they, nobody ever heard of the creepy goat fuckers from Swahili, actually, I have but I have the unrecorded demo, and I love right. it. So. I have it. See? <laughs> Let's see. Butch Butch has got uh, loudness on the prowl. He's got the scream. Let it scream. He also mentioned Skid Row. He mentioned Ozzy. Uh, he had Queen innuendo also. And uh, what do I have that hasn't been mentioned? I mentioned uh, so I had Queen also. I had Morbid Angel, Bless for the Sick. I had Meshuggah, Contradictions Collapse, uh, Leonard Skinner, 1991, really good studio album from them. I had Skid Row, Slave to the Grind. I had Van, Van Halen for Unlawful Carnal Knowledge. I don't mind that album. Uh, I had Overkill Horoscope. I've got a very cool, psychedelic, space rocky prog band called Osric Tentacles, Strangitude, killer album. Uh, let's see, Caius Wretch. Uh, oh yeah <laughs> i had fate warning parallels i had iced earth as well monster magnet spine of god cathedral forest of equilibrium sleep volume one the obsessed lunar womb metal church a human factor badlands voodoo highway and Almer brothers band shades of two worlds that's what i got so so nobody on this show mentioned metallica though not one person or mentioned the black use your illusion you know yeah. you got to hear about it you or know you got no use your illusion, no Metallica. No, yeah, well, these are our. Oh wait, you know what? Hold on. We're better than that. That's yeah, I'm gonna say good. <laughs> Speaking of Steve, Steve also, that. Steve Same. also gave me his picks. Hold on, I totally spazzed out here. So Steve picked. <laughs> uh, wait, let's see. What did Steve pick? Rush, roll the bones. What? Echo negative, slow, deep, and hard. Ozzy, no more tears. Oh, Death, human, and immolation. Dawn of possession. Mm. Oh, Immolation. Nobody mentioned that one. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's like, and they're from Yonkers, New York. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I boys right there. And then there's honorable mentions. Honorable mentions were Metal Church, The Human Factor, Guns and Roses, Use Your Illusion One and Two, <laughs> Sepultura Arise, and Soundgarden, Bad Motor Finger, as well as Suffocation, Effigy. Oh, nope, we didn't get out of here without a Guns and Roses. They Guns popped it. Oh, I said <laughs> So there you have it, everybody. Uh, our favorite albums from 1991. <laughs> you know what you got to do down in the comments below. List your five favorites and any honorables you might want. And, uh, you know, if, if there's some stuff we picked tonight that you don't like or stuff we talked about that we don't like, hey, that's the way it goes, right? We all can't like the same stuff. So uh, anyway, honest. thanks for watching. Visit us on it. the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together. All the damn oh, time. Please all subscribe the damn time. Time. and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. And we'll see you back here in two weeks on the Hudson Valley Squares for Chris Allo, Ryan Scow, Bryce, Count Ralphus, Rob Lasante, Craig Kaminsky, <laughs> Nick Franco, and Karen La Preziosa, and Butch, and Steve Keeler. <laughs> Till next time. Good one, everybody. <laughs>